Hi, welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this episode marks the show's first anniversary. I know, right? My guest this week is writer-director Jeremy Lalonde, whose new movie, How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town, opens the Canadian Film Festival in Toronto on March 30th and rolls out across North America later this year. He's also just launched an Indiegogo funding campaign for his next film, The Go-Getters, starring friends of the show Aaron Abrams, Christian Brune, Christine Horn, and Scott Thompson. You might want to check that out. Jeremy picked Annie Hall, the 1977 romantic comedy about the relationship between a stand-up comedian named Alvy Singer and a woman named Annie Hall, seen through the surreal filter of said comedian's neuroses. A slow starter at the box office, the film became a cultural phenomenon, winning four Oscars including Best Picture, Best Actress for Diane Keaton, Best Director for Woody Allen, and Best Original Screenplay for Allen and Marshall Brickman. It's a time capsule of mid-1970s America in a lot of different ways, from the East Coast-West Coast cultural rivalries to the stuff that was on TV at the time. Oh, and there was one other person who was responsible for the movie's success, and we'll get to that. This is someone else's movie. Annie Hall wasn't the first Woody Allen movie I ever saw. I think the first Woody Allen movie I ever saw was Mighty Aphrodite. And the reason why I knew about that was because I was a big Tarantino nerd. I was like 12 or 13, and I knew they were dating, and she had been nominated for the Oscar. So I think that was my first Woody Allen movie, was Mighty Aphrodite. What a weird experience that must have been. Yeah, and I was 12, and I really dug it. And then I watched um, Everyone Says I Love You. and So that was like when I got in on Woody Allen, I started watching Forward, Mm -hmm. and I never went back words until... You know, eight, nine years later, I went to film school, and someone gave me Annie Hall. Someone I knew, they knew I'd seen, like, you know, 15 Woody Allen movies, right, right. but I hadn't seen any, like, the real classic, wow. amazing ones, right? What a weird perspective. That's, like, that's fascinating, because I'm old enough that it's always been there. Yeah. And I think the first one I saw theatrically was... Must have been Midsummer Night's Sex Comedy. So I don't even want to tell you the one first one I saw theatrically because it's just you'll, you'll groan. No, no. It no. was the terrible uh, Jade Scorpion. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that was, I'm like, oh, that's the first one I saw. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's what it was. But that's like that's <laughs> demonstrating the DVD gateway drug effect, right? Like yeah. you'll go see anything if you've already caught up. Yeah, you're already in. So, yeah. so I was a fan already, and then someone threw. And then, so I was in film school, and so and this is like VHS were still, and so we were just handing back and forth each other <laughs> stacks of, de- of movies, saying, "Watch this!" Oh, you haven't seen this? Like filling each other's black holes in, right? And so yeah. someone gave me um, that and like the apartment and a couple of these movies that I just hadn't gotten around to, and so I remember like I hadn't, I was I got up early one morning, I couldn't get back to sleep, and so I popped in Annie Hall at like six a.m. Whatever. Oh yeah. And just going, ah, it's a romantic comedy. It's like, it's, it's, it, I'll probably enjoy it. It'll be fine. And then just sit, and then it was in a daze for the rest of the day. Just go, and then found my buddy. And I'm like, what's another Woody Allen movie like that? And it's like, there isn't. <laughs> it's like, shit. It's true. <laughs> and it's true. And it's, and so that was my first experience was in film school and, and kind of the best experience where nobody had really ruined it for me in the sense of like really building it up. Right. So I saw it in a really pure way where all I knew was that it was a an earlier Woody Allen movie that was a comedy with Diane Keaton. And that's all I knew. And that I'm so glad that that was my experience for the first time watching it. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> I by the time I got to film school I was already well aware of it. I had oh. seen it. Um I think there was a there was a series of home video releases. I, I know I didn't see it in a theater until the 90s. But the Woody Allen movie, in quotes, sure. that was already established. That mm-hmm. was the thing that everybody... That was the language. Like, oh, this is like a Woody Allen movie. Or trying to be a Woody Allen movie. Or something yeah, which, like that. which is... There's a lot of those. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. But, well, I did my bad, like, after watching Annie Hall going... You know, every short film I wrote at film school was just a bad <laughs> variation on, like, stealing shit from Annie Hall. Right. But you you sort of understand why that would happen, because it is so gargantuan on the landscape. Like, there really wasn't... I mean, there kind of was, which is what's great. Like, everybody forgets that Annie Hall is filled with flights of fancy and strange yeah. little flashbacks in the story of how that became the movie that we know. Yeah, we'll get into that. Amazing, yeah. 
Uh, but at the time, like he'd been making disposable. Just he was, he was like the Zucker Brothers of his era at the yeah. beginning. Bananas and, and yeah, that was his first real. That was his fifth movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Love first... and Death kind of gets there. Love and Death is sort of the the natural. It's the whole way. The film he made before, but it is the natural precursor. Uh, and then Annie Hall comes out, and it just brings together all of the things he does and leavens them with this melancholy and and this incredible humanity. And it's grounded. Yeah, and it's about it's ridiculous, but it's time. grounded. Yeah, yeah. And and it, what was interesting, especially the year it came out, that it was also like the year of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. So you've got this in in two very different ways. You've got this romantic comedy that completely reinvents that genre. And or reestablishes it in a, in a way that people can finally respect it. Yeah, you know. And then you got Star Wars, which is the first real blockbuster ever, yeah. in a weird way, right? It's kind of creates the '80s yeah, in yeah, its yeah. own way, right? And and they're both up for Best Picture, which would never happen now. Yeah, you know what I mean? It would just it'd be you know it just wouldn't happen. And and it won. It beat you know. And I tell my son that who is a giant <laughs> Star Wars fan now. He's we have an Annie Hall poster on. I'm like, well, it, you know, if Star Wars had won Best Picture, Star Wars would be on the wall. Yeah, I I was. <laughs> Nine, I guess, when that happened. And I remember not having seen Annie Hall, but not understanding that there was a possibility that anything else could be better than Star Wars. <laughs> it just, it didn't make sense. Yeah. And I think that was the first time I became invested in the Oscars because of this incredible injustice. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't dispute the argument uh, now that Annie Hall is a superior film to Star Wars, it, just, it is. It just—I mean, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's just different. It's just—it's yeah. a very different. But it's—but it's amazing, and uh, that's what I love about that, that. That two, those two films could be against each other for Best Picture. Yeah, and there's like Julia and the Turning Point, and all these other films that nobody even remembers. Yeah, about. and it was the, and there was the Goodbye Girl because that's what the only thing that upset Annie Hall from sw- oh, sweeping. That's right, that's right. Dreyfus, Dre- Dreyfus won for what beat Woody Allen for Best Actor. Yeah, and the idea though that the academy would embrace Annie Hall still seems bizarre to me because the other films were much more likely winners like those those other movies that were nominated were sort of staid Hollywood productions that you expect to get Oscar nominations yeah. and Annie Hall is this weird little upstart movie from a director who said he didn't care about awards and he really wasn't chasing one and he made it and released it in much the same way he continues to make and release things, which is without any regard for the world around him. Yeah, and once a year. And like you said, it's like, you know, when you look at the... con. I mean, you look at it now and it's like, well, of course, Annie Hall would have won and, you know, Woody Allen's considered one of the, the best auteurs of film setting, this and that. But it's like, at the time, like you said, it's like, it would be like the guys who made Scary Movie making a serious movie and it winning Best Picture. Yeah. And best actors, and best screenplay, and best director. Yeah, yeah. Which is like what kind of which was like what the kind of movies he was making at the time were. They're just like full full of sight gags and yeah. Well, he'd made everything you wanted to know about sex like what two years or three years earlier. Yeah. And suddenly he's there. He's doing this, and like it is a legitimate leap of maturity and intelligence and storytelling craft mm-hmm. from a guy who really like hadn't shown interest in that stuff before. Just the idea that that he had made this incredible 180 from frivolity into you know like his last in love and death he's quoting bergman for a laugh and it's great yeah. but it's just there's nothing that lands the way even the flashback to the lobster scene lands in Annie hall it's just this incredible yeah arc, like it's lightning striking yeah and the story behind that is ralph rosenblum uh, his editor and if you if mm-hmm. you want to take it, feel free. Yeah, well, there's a great. Uh, I don't know if you've read it. There's a great book called "When the Edit." No, the when, when the, the shooting, shooting stops, stops, the editing yeah, begins. Or something I have like it upstairs. That. Yeah, yeah. When the shooting stops, book. the cutting begins. Yeah, and I mean that. I mean Annie Hall just in and of itself was was literally created in the editing room, as I'm sure you know. Is like, yeah, yeah. What was the original title was Anne H- I never, Anhedonia. I never say it properly. That, Anhedonia. That's how you say. I'm it. probably mispronouncing it. I wish I could like that there existed the script for the original yeah version of the movie because there was like they shot. What is some of the stuff that they actually... Because there's all this stuff that I think that was in the scripts that they never actually got to. But some of the stuff they shot that they never used was like... The there, there's, a, there's a Garden of Eden sequence. There was like Kafka and yeah. Nietzsche playing against the New York Knicks. <clears throat> like there's some sequence like that that yeah. apparently was shot that exists somewhere in some like bin. Yeah. Or and it's probably gone because he didn't care. There's a scene that Rosenblum mentions which I just... I'd love to see or steal because it's brilliant. Uh, where he's where Woody Allen's character, um, where Alvy Singer is being interrogated by Nazis. Oh, I've heard about that one. For something, and uh, he says he won't talk. He won't talk, and they say we're going to break you. We, you must 
give us the codes or whatever it is. And he says, I can't tell you anything and pulls out a sock puppet and says, but he can. <laughs> and th- I, that's amazing. 40 years later, that's still, it's still really funny. funny. Um, the idea that, yeah, that a movie as lifelike as Annie Hall had room for that stuff. And it, it still does have it. It contains it within it. Like there's weird illustrations of memory. Like the, the house I made a list of all the different like techniques that it kind of like played with instead oh, of romantic comedy. I don't want to like miss any because it's amazing. It's like, yeah, it's like fragmented plot, breaking the fourth wall, skewed narrative, flashbacks, flash forwards, stream of consciousness, split screens, double exposures, animation, instant replay. Yeah. You know, subtitles. It's just yeah. like... Subjective presentation of memory, which is something yeah. nobody was doing at the time. The scene where... Uh, Alvy remembers Grammy watching him, and he suddenly revealed as an Orthodox Jew to yeah. her eyes. Or even that mo- that scene when when uh, she makes the the flub, and he yeah. says, "Well, you said this," and then he turns to the camera, and he's like, "You guys were here, so you heard it." Yeah, like that. Kind of and the stuff. McLuhan scene too, which again, which was originally supposed to be Fellini, and yeah. then Fellini wouldn't do it. But I get like <laughs> that actually works better. Fellini probably wouldn't have been as funny. Yeah, McLuhan just by virtue of being an even more obscure figure. Like Fellini is part of Alan's ongoing like body worship thing that he's doing, yeah. where filmography becomes idolized, uh, and you know, like Stardom Memories is basically eight and a half and things yeah. like that. But that scene would never would never. I, I I have a hard time believing that if you made a movie now, that McLuhan scene would would make it into the final cut. Yeah, because really, it's like you can pull that scene out. Sure, but why would you? Yeah, it's so strong. Um, before I forget, the subtitles the first time. We were talking before the podcast started about, like, you know, you kind of show certain people movies as litmus tests of, you know, can we be in a relationship together? Yeah. And Annie Hall, for me, was always that movie. It's like, or just a new person that I, I get along with really well and they hadn't seen it. And it's like, we're going to sit down and watch it together. Yeah. And I haven't done it in a long time, but that was a movie I did a lot with. And I remember taking my wife to see it for the first time. It was playing at the Review or something back when they, the, the one... The, the the five cinemas in Toronto had those like one screen they're all banded together oh yeah and so I took her to see it and they had like a great film print but what happened during the movie was the subtitle scene didn't uh-huh. have the subtitles really and I was sitting there going this is like an interpositive that's it was, amazing it was weird I'm like I had to watch it's like she's watching for the first time not knowing so of course I had to go back to my place after I'm like you need to watch that scene again <laughs> I was like because you don't you didn't get the full benefits of how that scene is supposed to play yeah um, but it was interesting watching it that way and oh. knowing that I was missing in going, the scene kind of still works, but it doesn't quite, it's well, still... Well, the laughs aren't there. Like, you're just watching an awkward conversation. It's just a bad scene. <laughs> um, it's amazing, because of the, you know, like, the DVD famously, they screwed up the subtitles when mm. Jim released it, and they had a little, it was like hard of hearing kind of subtitling, so it would say thinking, and then the title. Yeah of the text and it just everybody was furious like that the Laserdisc is correct it actually okay. is a film print with the subtitles uh, and Criterion initially released a Laserdisc that was also properly formatted and then for 15 years every DVD release got it wrong so it blows the joke because you're supposed to think for a second you're supposed to wonder where these words came from and what it means and as soon as you so figure great. it out that is yeah that's Woody Allen saying yeah you get me and it's a great moment, and no, like no one had done that before. And you can't do it now because you're just stealing it. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just one of those great things. It's like, it just, it's, 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 and the thing that kills me is that he doesn't care for the movie at the end of the day. Like he thinks, oh, I mean, and I think the biggest problem with Woody Allen as as a filmmaker of himself is just that he doesn't. He he can't move on from what his original concept of something was because right. he hates most of his movies. So every movie, right? yeah, every movie, every movie's a failure because because he didn't, you know, do what he intended in the script. Where I think most filmmakers accept the compromises that come along the way and shift it into something greater. Right. Well, where if think, you're adaptable, you're going to make better. Which films. I don't think he is. <laughs> but but we sit back going like Annie Hall is is a masterpiece. Yeah. But be, but because whatever he intended to make didn't work out. And phenomenal that that movie was found in the editing room, given that it was supposed to be something else entirely. Yeah. And that Annie Hall was just supposed to be, like, one-third of the story. And there was all these other girls, these other women that were, were part of it that... Yeah, well, I mean, Carol Kane's character, mm-hmm. Alison Portionick, had much more to do. Mm-hmm. There are entire subplots that were yanked out. Um, Probably the, more Shelley Duvall. I would assume, yeah. More and Jeff Goldblum. 
<laughs> no, his part was what I it was. He's one and done. I think he needs to be. Yeah. There. Well, Sigourney Weaver, right? The character. Yeah, at the end. Doesn't even have a name. Woman no. outside. I don't think her part was any bigger though. I think she was because that was her first thing. Yeah, but it right? must have been a close up. You just assume that there's a scene there. I never assume there was a close up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but the idea that yeah that you chip away at this gargantuan block of footage and find a movie that feels like as alive and weird and personal it it is kind of amazing just the idea yeah. that those um you know that the as as Rosen, as Rosenblum writes the, uh, the the monologue Alvi's monologue into the camera at the beginning was shot as an afterthought mm -hmm. to pull it all together well the, and the the monologue at the end about the eggs yeah. uh was something that they thought of on the way to a screening which is just They're in the cabin, and Woody Allen wrote it down on like a napkin or something. Yeah. On the way to like a preview screening. Before it screened, he already knew it was wrong. And yeah. he wanted to cancel the screening, I think, because like the ending's wrong. We need to fix it. Yeah. It's, but, but it's such a great line. And yeah. it's just. And, and it's it, a great device. Like it puts you right into the story. Into mm -hmm. the, you're invested emotionally right away based on the opening jokes that he tells. You know, that just that. Uh, it is kind of incredible that up until that point, Alan, who had been a stand-up comedian forever, didn't address the audience. Like, never really tried to incorporate yeah. that aspect of his persona because he's sort of this weird voyeuristic presence in the, in his early movies. He's, he's commenting on the action. Like, he, he does address the audience at one point in Love and Death, uh, but it's just a cheap joke. Or no, yeah. no, it's not. It's, sorry, it's a chastity belt scene in um, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex. Yes. Where he uh, briefly breaks the fourth wall. And you can feel the movie nudging, like, I want more of that guy. I want more of that presence. And then suddenly in Annie Hall, that's what we get. Yeah, well, and it's the first time he's really trying to connect to the audience. Mm -hmm. And by, like, and just the way he stops people and talks to them on the street. The vibrating egg. Yeah. You know, that that, yeah. that, that whole bit. Um, and I wish, I, I, I'd like to believe there's something where he's talking to that horse, where, like, <laughs> the next scene starts over top of it, 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 it prelapses it, but it's like, I think there's a bit with the horse that they decided not to keep, but they wanted the, the visual of the horse. Yeah. Um, but there's also, there's the interesting moments in it where, like, there's that weird scene where it's like a point of view of them walking towards a beach and it's like shaky camera it's it's ugly mm. but it, and there's there's voiceover under them talking that you're like what like that was one of those things they must have just discovered and needed to patch together yeah but, but it feels like a Truffaut reference too like it feels like the 400 blows is working its way in yeah all of a sudden well and that's when he really started to be influenced by all the Europeans or it started to show his hand yeah. right because even with like the lack of score is a Bergman thing mm -hmm. you know what I mean it's like I don't even know if there's any I think there's it's all just underscore it's all just like cues but I don't think there's any music in any hall that you would consider score I don't think so no, um, I think the, the the big emotional moments are provided by flashbacks to songs we've already heard. Yeah, it's like, Diane Keaton doing those those songs, oh, that amazing sequence when like the and the, the sounds of the kitchen and the, the bar just like clanging against her her song. Yeah, it's so heartbreaking yeah. and amazing. And then it's presented properly, and it does break your heart. Yeah, at the end, it's um, yeah. I think you can't. I'm I'm kind of amazed that it's taken me even this long to get to Keaton uh, to mention her. We haven't even talked about that because Keaton. yeah, performance-wise, she's not acting in so many ways. Like she's yeah. creating a character out of herself in a way that it kind of echoes. Like she'd already made a couple of movies with him, and they had a relationship, and they were clearly comfortable with each other. But what she's doing in Annie Hall is, I think it's the closest I've seen to her be her. Yeah, in in film. But it's also a performance, which is a really remarkable thing. And at a, at a point in time, too, in the 70s, when that wasn't happening a lot. I mean, the naturalism of performance was being an issue. Yeah. But this was, like, this feels like new territory. And not just because of the way it's cut and shot and presented, but whenever she's on screen, it's alive in a way that I don't think a movie had been it until then. Or at least not aware of it. No, exactly, and she's and, and and that's and I think that's unique for him in his filmography of having an actor play a very because he's famous for not directing mm -hmm. for like just kind of letting them do their own thing and not getting involved at all. Yeah. Oh, you can tell now. Like, yeah. In the last, it, that's something else too. Like, <laughs> his, his approach towards capturing performance has has gotten so um, laissez faire. It isn't even the word for it. He's just yeah. stopped trying. But then, like, there's a sense of at least when he's acting with someone in a scene that they're going somewhere. Yeah, they're doing something together. Yeah, exactly. But for him, it's like you know he knew her so well, so it was almost like he got a sense of that she would be interesting and and could just let her go and do her thing. And I, I I'm sure 
she's just the kind of person that would insist on having a conversation about it. And so he's not necessarily directing her, but I'm sure there was something yeah. to their banter. You almost get the feeling that you're watching rehearsals or, or you're eavesdropping on something real mm. in a few scenes where it's just, it's it's not intense exactly, but there's there's a charge. There's something going on, which I think translates into the romantic aspect of the film where suddenly we're part of their lives and we're not watching actors. We're watching life. Yeah, and part of it must stem too from the idea that we know that they were a couple in real life. And and he, you know, adamantly says that this is not autobiographical. Yeah. He she, says that a but lot. But then she says that it was. Yeah. Or part of it was. And, you know, her last name is maiden name was Hall in real life and, and uh, I think Annie was her middle name or something. There's or Diane is her so there's some yeah. thing it's there. It's close enough. It's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> So, but either, whether or not, it's like we, we bring that to it. We know that, like, that was probably one of the first popular pairings of knowing that, you know, life is bleeding into art. Um, I guess by that point, Elizabeth Taylor and Bridget Burton had already had their, their stuff going on. Sure. But, um, but it felt, I mean, whenever you see Taylor and Burton together, with maybe the exception of Virginia Woolf, you feel like they're playing to the camera in a way that isolates you further. Yeah, there's yeah. no sense of, there's no sense of, self-consciousness in, in this where they're you know well she's Cleopatra and he's Mark Antony of course they're not playing their real relationship right and here it's just like people knew who Keaton was from from the Godfather but Woody Allen was still pretty much just Woody Allen to people I don't yeah. think that what the mass audience even saw any Hall until the Oscar nominations it just sort of floated right. out there like everything else he'd done yeah and she and she was like I think like you said it's like she was as close to being her and I think that was by design too and and there's those famous stories about talking about the the costume the wardrobe and mm-hmm. and, pe- and the wardrobe person was like, we, why she can't wear that? And he was just let her. And he just said, just let her wear whatever she wants. And of course, you know, it became like a fashion statement, yeah. and, and she inspired so many different things from that. Uh, but that's just her being her. Yeah, that weird New York bohemian thing, which now hipsters are reclaiming. Yeah, mm-hmm. Diane Keaton created really the <laughs> the yeah. bohemian hipster New York look, yeah. um, and and set it in a world where she doesn't stick out either. Like she looks. She's dressed strangely, no question, but she's dressed appropriately for the world. I mean, even the like the flashbacks, Alison Portionick is wearing this weird flowing thing. In, mm-hmm. my, in my memory, I'm pretty sure it actually happened. Yeah. Um, Carol Kane is, is doing more like a hippie flower child thing, and the, it creates a striking contrast in the in the flashback that further isolates Annie in memory. Like she's stands out everywhere. But she belongs everywhere at the same time. It's like that whole Pygmalion aspect of the underlying the story is that he, you know, Alvi meets this wonderful woman, decides she needs to be better, and makes her surpass him. Like forces yeah. her to get smarter and better than he is to the point where she can leave him. Oh, I never thought of the Pygmalion. Yeah. But it's totally there. What we see in the film is stitched together out of a much larger and more um, aggressive engagement with it in the course of the original film. Interesting. Yeah. Because I huh. think it ties to and the, the the title Anhedonia is about the inability to experience pleasure. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think that larger point was that Alvi wants to make her as dead as he is, mm-hmm. intellectually stimulated but emotionally tame. Yeah, we had and that, ends that, up. Yeah, that great scene where she's in the bookstore where he's trying to give her like Death in the Valley and yeah. this and that. He's like, I think you'd like this better than those cat books you read, <laughs> you were going yeah. get or whatever it is, right? Yeah, and that's still the spine of the movie, more or less, is the, the the life and death of their relationship. But it comes much more into focus, or it came much more into focus in the in an earlier version of the script. Yeah, but it was still a comedy. <laughs> no, but it's all there because you even have that great moment that that plays off on itself when he's trying to convince her to go into adult education courses. And then, and then it instantly cuts to the fu- you know the future where he's like, adult education's stupid <laughs> because she's now connected with her professor and they've bonded on some kind of deeper level and that makes him feel self conscious. Yeah, it's you a, know? I mean, in the present now, when we we are seeing, I guess the equivalent would be the Apatow films where they're all about insecurity and and, and male guilt and confusion and arrested adolescence and all that stuff. Mm. There really wasn't anything that dealt with them with that perspective which is yeah like it just it's all Woody Allen which is why as a romantic comedy it's it's such a bizarre film in that it it really did like legitimize the the genre um so and you know we've destroyed it since then uh and every now and then something perks up to kind of bring it back Mm -hmm. um but that was the only time I think Woody Allen and Judd Apatow will ever be compared to (laughs) right now we've done it today yeah I know but it's there but it's like but at his heart I mean Judd Apatow's stories are always about connection and about like 
you know, people just trying to figure their own stuff out. And for me, Annie Hall is about a story about a relation, the relationship that helps you get to the right relationship. Mm. You know, it's like yeah. Annie and, and Alvy were never right for each other, but they needed each other to get past that per- certain hump in their life to like get over themselves. Like Alvy will now forever, even though he's, you know, he's in his 40s, he just turns 40 as the, yeah. as the movie ends, I guess, right? He starts, the monologue is the last the beginning is the end of the movie. Yeah, chronologically, in, sense. Yeah. in terms of his narrative. Um, and he's, I think for the first time, he's now, like, whatever relationship he enters into after this, this story takes place, he's going to be better at it. Yeah. You know, he's, go- he's, he's learned his lesson as he moves on, that she's taught him, she's probably the most central relationship of his life, even if the next person he meets is the love of his life. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's and, the the one that helps you be better, be more yourself to figure out who you are and what you want. Mm-hmm. That's that's what Annie Hall is about. Yeah. Um, which again is why the title is even perfect because of course it has to be her. Yeah. It can't be anything it else. It had to be you. Right? It was going to be Annie and Alvy for a while, right? And that that didn't. It work. had to be Jew was one of the titles. Which I kind of want them <laughs> to have gone with just to see that on Marquis. Uh, we have Photoshop. We can make our own. That's true. I'm, I'm perverse enough that I would have liked to see that released into the world and to see, you know, like Charlton Heston announce it at the Oscars. And best picture goes to... It had to be Jew. It Jill. had to be. Is this right? <laughs> what, what the... I, ladies and gentlemen, I played Judah Ben-Hur and let me tell you... I do a terrible Charlton Heston. Um, the... Yeah, the... The miracle of Annie Hall is that it is Annie Hall. It's like that it turns out to be this movie despite every possible outcome. Uh, op- well, outcome anxiety, obstacle. I think, was the title at yeah. one point. And Terrible it, titles. And they're all like, if you look at Woody Allen's output, he's picked some bad titles. Like, they're, th- th- this has happened. They're like interiors. It's perfect when you see the film, but until then, eh, it's, yeah, it's pretty not a big. Title. It doesn't sell. You say Woody Allen made a movie called Annie Hall, and it's like, oh, who's she? Like, you're instantly you're a little interested. Curious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of other terrible titles of My Every Day is a good title. Mm-hmm. Bullets Small Time Crooks. Bullets Over really Broadway is a good title. Yeah. Shadows and Fog, too vague. Curse yeah. of the Jade Scorpion. That's ooh. Yeah, see? Magic in the Moonlight. Which come on. Isn't that it's I mean it's, Midnight in Paris isn't an amazing title. But, but that's okay, because it's, it's intriguing enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's evocative. Uh Scoop. <laughs> Nobody remembers Scoop. My mother in law loves Scoop. Really? She thinks the scene where, spoiler alert, where uh, Woody Allen dies. <laughs> right. Like, there's, he just drives off. She hella- killed herself laughing. Really? When that happened. Okay. Didn't surprise the heck out yeah. of me. Because it's, it's just one, it's one of the lesser comedies, as, yes, as, as I think. They, they can, that's being kind. Yeah. Oh, um, I just... There was a point. I'm trying to remember exactly what the point was. I think it was absolutely... No. It's not absolutely anything. Anything else. Uh, the the Larry David one, anything else? Where I just like no, anything else oh, no, was the right. one with uh, is, Jason Biggs, right? Uh, anything else is the one where I first decided, I uh, this is like it's going too far. We're going to a bad place, and this is never gonna. He's never gonna be able to pull the, this together. Again. The uh, was Larry that? David one is anything else? No, we just said anything see? else. See, see, this is what oh, I'm... it's close in that title, yeah. and it's not absolutely anything. Device. Which is a Terry Jones movie with Simon Pegg. This just come out. Um. I'm so. This is amazing. Why? I can't remember. Two fine brains here. We I can't. reviewed the damn thing and decided that that was going to be my last Woody Allen review. Oh, really? I just felt like, yeah, I felt like I had nothing else to say. You were all tired. Whatever works. You were all, whatever. Ah! I just right? Like, is that it? You were faster than the internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, the signal's not great down here. Um, <laughs> but that's it, right? Whatever works? Yeah. Okay. That explains why I was going with absolutely anything because it's also a, it's an alliterative title. Well, anything else is such a weird. Yeah, it's his post nine eleven romantic comedy, and but it's also him trying to, to redo Annie Hall. Yeah, yeah, in a weird way, which is probably the other reason my brain burped it up. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Twenty years later, he tried to do it again. Twenty five. There's even like that like uh, that drug scene. He's trying to like recreate the cokes. Yeah, sniffing scene, yeah. the coughing and, scene, and that was my first. You know, after. A few movies that weren't very good, but that was the one where I just thought, I think I'm done. Like, I think I can see Hollywood Ending had already come out, I believe, or was about to. Maybe it was the next one. But they're just these weird films. It was around the same time. Where he was just sort of data mining his own work and pulling out the same plots and reconfiguring them and pretending that he hadn't made this movie before. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, it goes back to what you said about him never being satisfied with an execution of a premise, because it clearly he's reworking those films. Well, even Midnight... Uh, Midnight Mid- in Paris is a short story you wrote in the 60s. Or I would I mean uh, Manhattan Murder Mysteries. Ugh. Was kind of like taken out of the Annie Hall original storyline. There, there was a murder mystery in yeah. there. 
which was and it was pulled out and repurposed into that because Marshall Brickman also co-wrote that. Yeah, and clearly it would not have worked in any hall. Like that's what Manhattan Murder Mystery proves is that he is not his own best. Yeah, editor. God, right? Or yeah. certainly his best editor. It's got that great bit though with the the tape recorders, the um, dueling tape recorders, while they're trying to like yeah play the yeah the murder message. I, it would maybe have been worth watching if that was the one scene that survived. The there's you, there's always like one fun little sequence, but not a, they don't necessarily always justify watching the whole thing. But then you've got something like Annie Hall, you've got some like yeah. Mighty Aphrodite, which is just delightful. Yeah, and the Greek chorus again. It's like who would ever have thought to do a Greek chorus. As as part of a story about like uh, adoption, yeah, in, in a weird way, not really adoption, well, but, but a contemporary drama about well, comedy drama, yeah, about fatherhood and, and all that other stuff. It's and and this is the bit where we get where we kind of have to look into the abyss, yeah, on Woody Allen. Where I've done two episodes of the show that were Polanski films, and at some point you have to sort of confront the idea of separating the artist from the art. That was literally something I put in my notebook to talk about. Yeah, and it was like. It's yeah, and and I don't know exactly where I land on that. Yeah, because the thing I keep not saying here, I've been stopping myself, not consciously, but I realize I just keep finding reasons not to talk about it. Is that Annie Hall to me is part of a very solid trilogy with Love and Death on one side and Manhattan on the other, and mm-hmm. Manhattan on the other is the one where it gets weird. It gets weird, and you know we're talking just a week after the the Claude Jutra revelations where there weren't revelations it was an open secret and that's something that I can much more easily compartmentalize because all of his work is about children and yeah when you hear oh also he was assaulting children uh, sorry uh, Jutra yeah yeah not not Woody Woody Allen Allen. yeah Yeah. for the listeners just in case people are going wait Uh, Woody Allen's work even in Annie Hall, it reflects the dynamic of his relationship with Keaton. He has always found a way to feed himself into his movies. And if you believe him, it's completely unconscious. Because he keeps saying over and over and over again that his work has no relationship to his life and he doesn't look to his own life. Um, which is bizarre, because increasingly it becomes very obvious that he is only writing one kind of movie, and it's the kind of movie that has Woody Allen's brain in it, because he can really only... Mm-hmm. Like he's, it's what somebody said about Kubrick when Eyes Wide Shut came out. It's the work of a man who hasn't left the house in 20 years. Like you've, <laughs> you've been locked alone with yourself in your office, yeah. and this is what comes out. And over and over again, he'll be writing about nostalgic stories, or he'll be writing about the 20s because it's safer there, and because white people could do whatever they wanted. <laughs> and that's a, like, that's a theme in Magic in the Moonlight, which has this amazing tone-deaf racial appropriation by Colin Firth, who's playing an Asian mystic. Or he's playing a character who passes as an Asian mystic. mystic. No, it's it's not yeah. it's not a good idea, and it's not a good movie. But with Woody Allen, you sort of have to grapple with the idea of him being confessional and also never engaging with this really ugly part of his life, which is that he fell in love with Mia Farrow's adopted daughter and married her, and they've been together for... Yeah. 30 years now? Is yeah. it that long? No, well, 20, well, at going the on time, 25, right? It, it was, was the husband, early 90s. It was right? husbands and wives. Yeah. Which they is were 92. shooting that when everything fell apart. Right. And, and they, of course, husbands and wives is also about... Well, it's literally about the breakup. Yeah. And, and they, what's fascinating with that movie is like that one great visceral scene where he and Mia Farrow actually break up in the movie. Their characters break up. I have that. It's like all of those great jump cuts and it's like you get a sense of this is a whole night in, the, mm-hmm. in that fight. That was shot after she had found the photographs and all that kind of stuff, and they and they like, I don't know how they convinced her to come back to yeah, finish the movie, but they did, and that scene was sh- shot after. Which, when you're watching it with that knowledge, it kind of goes, you go, it's like, it's amazing that they were able to do that, and you're also going, there's a lot of real stuff going on there right now. Yeah, and it's, it's mirrored in the way that Alan casts increasingly younger women opposite himself and his other and his leading men his avatars in later films yeah like that was a running gag yeah. I think just for people that it's like you know, he was kind of famous for that and then there's the whole other thing with Dylan Farrow which I don't even know that I can touch without offending someone yeah I don't know what well, that yeah because it's... at the time I mean I was around for the coverage in the 90s and it certainly sounded like Team Farrow uh, not Dylan but her her, her people her yeah. mom and the lawyers had engineered something and then Subsequently, it's still. It's see. This is where I'm like, what can I say? Well, that's because you know, I I honestly like I, right. I don't have an opinion on it because there's so many different. Well, this makes sense, but then that makes sense, and and I think Mia's been shown to be a little. 
I don't you know? Yeah. It's weird. I mean, the, the what I remember very clearly was a story that pointed out that the deposition that they showed people was riddled with pauses and cuts to create a narrative. And someone had said, like, this is really bad. If I, if I was making a movie, I'd say this is too obviously edited. So I don't know. I, I But I also... I, it's the kind of thing, like, when the Jutra news breaks, suddenly a lot of other people come forward. There's all this supporting evidence and it's circumstantial because one of them is dead and like one of the parties is dead sure. and you can't discuss it with him and, and there's no possibility of a criminal investigation but i don't doubt it like i i and this makes it sound like i don't necessarily believe the other the dylan farrow story and i don't know that that's true either and it's yeah. become such a, a contorted like i don't know how to deal with it on on a show like this, where ostensibly you're appreciating a work of art, sure, made by a you can't ignore it. You can't ignore yeah. it. Like that was the first note I wrote down. Is like separation of art and artist. Yeah, and, and any how I would have written how the fuck do you do I, that? You can't. You can't. Well, because like you said, it's like you know. For example, we have the the Gomeshi thing that just kind of wrapped up ish. Yeah, we're waiting on a verdict. Um, on a ruling. And uh, and and watching the shit show that that was of, of people just being. Uh, you know, so many people coming forward once one person does, uh, and, and in, the, in the case of the the Allen stuff, it's like it's really an isolated incident. Yeah, it's so, all weirdly like it's so strange that the whole thing is in family. Yeah, you don't have all so of a sudden Drew, well Drew Barrymore as... coming out saying, "Well, he touched me too," or yeah. this or that. It's like it's all just that, and so. And I want to believe that the people who continue to work with him wouldn't, if they really believed, but I don't know what that means either because. Even now, like people say, you want to work with Woody Allen, you say yes. Uh, mm-hmm. That's how that goes, apparently. In, in Hollywood or New York or wherever the, the bases of talent are gathered, people still really want to work with him. And he's worked with the same people over and over and over again. And then you just get the sense that like, it's just too strange mm-hmm. to be possible. But I, don't, like, I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know how I feel. My <laughs> impulse is to believe Dylan Farrow. But, but you know, I read a lot of that stuff because Woody Allen has always been one of my idols and just in terms of of filmmaking and so wanting to know I don't you know I can't idolize someone if I don't like look into both sides and consider both sides of it sure, yeah. and just looking at you know the not quite it's not Stockholm Syndrome but it's like the idea that like, she was so young and it's like and if you do, do have a, a person feeding you saying this eventually the difference between memory yeah it's the McMartin's effect right yeah the, yeah the it's like what kids were you convinced rem- that they had witnessed and participated in satanic rituals that never happened yeah so there's also that and it's like and of course that's something that you would you it's impossible to ever know yeah and good luck ever reconciling and I think that is the problem with with uh, with this whole scenario with the Woody Allen stuff is that it's just like well I don't think anyone will ever know yeah unless because the child can, you you can you know say that the child will never have a perfect memory of it because either they've been fed stuff or and so I just think from either side yeah. so I just think it's it's one of those things that you've got to for me anyway as someone who appreciates the artist you know I, I it's not that I ignore it but I look at it and I'm like well it's like it's an isolated incident it's not like you know twenty other people stepped up and said that this happened. And so, I don't. I don't like you know. I don't dig my hand in the sand and ignore it. Yeah. Because all those warning signs, like you've got like this, you know, the the storyline in Manhattan. You've got like a history of him casting younger women as love interest. Yeah, and even acknowledging in Manhattan that the despite the old soul nature of Mary Hemingway's character, that she is underage. Like that's a thing that is going on in the in the movie. Yeah, he doesn't. That's the one he doesn't ignore it in because she's yeah. so young. So it's interesting to yeah, I it, it's it's funny. I've, I've kind of almost avoided having a strong opinion on it because it's just there's so it's so inconclusive. Yeah, it's a really weird place to be. And again, somebody who for me who like I'm, I'm someone who is supposed to like, examine and deconstruct and completely understand everyone's motivation for everything mm-hmm. when I'm watching their work, and it's like well, like that's something I cannot. I can compartmentalize it for the purposes of watching this movie, but sometimes, yeah, it's just... It blends in. Yeah, it bl- it's, but sometimes it's also a lot more obvious than in some of his films where it feels like you're kind of witnessing the id live. It, like in Husbands and Wives, when you just cannot get away from that fact. I think about just like the idea of compartmentalizing the art and the artist a lot. It, one of my favorite um, examples is the... You read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Sure. Yeah? It's the one... I can't remember which book it's in, but it's that one chapter. It's like two or three pages... And it's just the one about the the poet that creates those writes those poems. 
you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, the story? So, yeah. And so he, this this guy, I think his, the poem, poet's name is Lil Alpha, and this woman left him, and so he moved to this jungle or forest and wrote the most heartbreaking poems ever on these, these giant leaves. And then he died, and years later the, the poems were found and published, and they became you know known across the universe as the most beautiful poems ever created. And um, and then some correcting fluid company thought, well, once, yeah, once time travel was invented, as right. as you do, uh, a correcting fluid company wondered if they couldn't have been more beautiful still. And so they went back in time, found him, offered him a very lucrative book deal if he would uh, just make a couple odd mistakes and and redo the poems with his corrective fluid. And of course, uh, the girl never got around to leaving him because now he had all this money, right. and so he never got around to writing the poems because he never felt these things. And so they said, well, that's not a problem. Here's a copy of the book. Here's a stack of leaves. Just hold yourself up in the jungle for a week, and we'll just bang these, this book right out. And then the question becomes, are the poems now meaningless? Yeah. Do, yeah. They mean, do they mean anything less now that we know that he didn't go through the experience? And so I always think of that, and I'm like, and I don't know what the answer is to that. Because it's, I think it's subjective. I think it, it comes down to how does something make you feel? when you watch it, right? And and sometimes you don't... You know, I, th- I think the artist can be wrong. I think you can find stuff in work that the artist didn't intend. Um, and just because they didn't intend it doesn't mean your interpretation of it is wrong. Right. Yeah, no, of course. It's how you receive it. Yeah. It's like, that's what culture is. It's the thing that is released into the world, but it's also then consumed and digested. That's mm-hmm. what we do. And fortunately... In this case, like Annie Hall is a film that you can watch without really going in that direction. Yeah. It, it's not an ugly movie. It's not a film about those emotions. It's a melancholy, nostalgic kind of feel. It wraps you in the sense that the. I mean, he tells us in the first scene, Annie and I broke up. Yeah, we know no that this isn't going to go well. But the way it goes is still very measured and calm, and, and, and it's not aggressive there's no uh you never feel assaulted the tone of the film is very gentle yeah and it's like and the closest and and it's broken up too like what's amazing is that the first time you see them together it's not like the it's not the tennis scene where they meet yeah it's uh i think it's the movie isn't it when he meets her at the movie theater yeah and so that's the first time they're they're already into the relationship so we're already into a, a fractured narrative um and the closest i can think of in terms of films that does that is eternal sunshine on the spotless mind but they've got a giant science fiction device wrapped around making that work. Yeah. Where here, it's just that's just the flow of the movie. Yeah. And it's through like the fractured pieces of his mind, and we accept it. Like I don't think. Yeah. Well, there's an Ellen Renee film, Je T'aime, Je T'aime, which which mm. Eternal Sunshine leans very heavily on, which I only found out later. I came to I saw uh, Gondry's film first, and then saw Je T'aime, Je T'aime, um, not long afterwards. But that was the one. Well, it's really this, and so you go back and see it, and. It was a mid-60s production, and I have no doubt that Alan saw it. But I also don't think Ralph Rosenblum did. Ah. Ralph, yeah, I, I think I think it's one of those absolutely subconscious things, maybe, working its way through, but it would never have come up structurally. And, and you know, given the way Alan discusses his work, he probably doesn't even know he did it. But yeah. there's no doubt in my mind that Annie Hall draws on it as much as Eternal Sunshine does. But again, in a completely humanist and, yeah. and dramatic way, rather than a spectacular science fiction way. Yeah, and I don't think I've any time I've ever showed the movie to anybody. Anybody ever felt like they were confused by where we were in the story, or like you just go along. Like that's kind of the the amazing thing and the beauty of that movie is that there's no. It should be more confusing, you know. It shouldn't work. Yeah. In so many ways. And that's and that's why it's like they, it's like they literally caught lightning in a bottle, you know. And so to recreate that, which is I think the problem with something like anything else, is that twenty years later he's gone on to try to recreate, and it's like you can't because that's not what you intended to make the first time, right? You know that's where you ended up, but it was by sh- you know not luck. There's a lot of talent at the table, you know. Brickman's talented, Allen's talented, Keaton's talented, Rosenblum's talented. Like they're all talented people, but. It just like it would never. It never would have. I think if they'd set out to make Annie Hall, they never would have made that Annie Hall. Yeah, and I mean, even like, as you're saying this, I'm thinking of the scene in the film where Alvy tries to recreate his romance with the with someone else with the lobster scene again. It's true. That's and it hilarious. doesn't play. 
it's like it's its own abject lesson to or its own object lesson to itself to not do this again and even Woody Allen couldn't that's Harold, hilarious like he couldn't follow his own advice that's funny I think that was that's the first stuff they shot too I wouldn't be surprised was the the lobster scenes it's such a great and, and that's and that itself has been like parroted and people have like tried to have, have ripped off that that idea too of like trying to recreate the past and ah yeah it's rich it's very it's a very it's one of those movies that, like I said, it's like, if someone hasn't seen it, I instantly have to make sure they see it. Especially if they like comedy and, and they like intelligent, smart movies. Mm-hmm. And, and you do get, like, you know, because, you know, as part of the conversation we were having about just, like, the art and the artist, like, you do have a lot of people that are just instantly, like, pushed off on Woody Allen now because of tabloid stuff. Um, and so some people wouldn't give it a chance, whereas 10 years ago, they would. But it's... Yeah. So, but I'm always surprised when, like, when a film, especially a film person, or or hasn't seen any Hall. Yeah. It just seems like it just seems like essential viewing. It's one of those obvious memory blocks, I think. Like, if you you either see it at a, at the right age and it's you it's with you forever, or you come to it later out of force, like you're persuaded to do it. I'm pretty sure Kate had seen it before we met, but I'm trying to remember. There was a period we met in 2002, and I know we didn't watch it for a while because I wouldn't let her watch the, the DVD with the Bork subtitles. <laughs> it's just like, mm, no, we, we'll get there. Yeah, that's And, funny. you know, I could also, the, this is a film that has been so weirdly misrepresented. The early video versions, I'm sure you must have seen one, had blue title backgrounds yeah. instead of the black, white on black text. For some reason, he altered it. Woody Allen and Home Video have always had a really weird, contentious relationship in the early films. Uh, pan and scan like Manhattan he insisted had yeah. to be squeezed so the entire that, film yeah. frame like there are laser discs which are like watching an unadjusted anamorphic DVD you, the whole fi- the whole frame is packed in but it's nightmare she'll make your eyes bleed mm-hmm. and then later they settled for an adjusted version I think there's only one I think I still have it there's only one laser disc that properly gets the 255 to 1 Panavision ratio right Crazy. even the DVDs are slightly yeah I have, I have, I have a DVD now but it, I remember that first I had it on VHS first and it was yeah. like yeah narrow boxed yeah tiny, <laughs> it, was, it was not the best way it's to like watch watching that movie Ben-Hur. yeah um, but uh, it, it's been through these different versions and, and for a film that won best picture and should therefore be enshrined it's got kind of smaller and maybe that's because you know Alan creatively surpassed it with films like Manhattan and Hannah and Her Sisters and mm-hmm. and, um, and Crimes and Misdemeanors, which I still hold up as his best film. Uh, because, Crimes and Misdemeanors is great. Because it marries the tones. It marries the... Which he later remade as Matchpoint. Yep. Or half of it anyway. And again, again, it, there's another one too that, that he, he pulled on very heavily. Oh, the, the Ewan McGregor one? Uh, yes. Thank you, Cassandra's Dream. Yeah. Which is so bad. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, the closest I can think of in terms of like just like a small scope Academy Award winner is like Marty. Yeah. Marty is just like about like a, an overweight guy, like Ernest Borgnine, yeah. um, is an overweight guy who just can't get a girl to like him. That's true. That's all the movie's about. It's a remake of a TV movie too, right? Wasn't it Sir or Craft Dinner Theater, whatever it was? Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's there are not a lot of films that catch the Academy's favor. I guess even in the '70s when everything was intimate and small. Yeah. Uh, they were still going for you know Rocky wins over Taxi Driver, things like that. Although Rocky, yeah. I guess, is a small movie until the last reel. Well, just in general, and this, and you know, I say this as a person who makes comedies. It's like, uh, uh, you know, generally speaking, comedic filmmakers are treated like second-class citizens. Sure. Especially when it comes to anything serious, right? Yeah. You know, it's like it, there is no comedy category in the Oscars. Like we all know what a drama is when we see it, but comedy is. If you're doing your job right, it's in everything. Like even a horror film can be funny as well. There's there's room. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's tough to find movies that don't have any levity to them. Yeah. Uh, like I haven't seen The Revenant yet, but I assume oh, yeah, that movie one. is. Yeah. Is there is there a good joke? No, no, no. <laughs> that's good two bear. and a half hours of, of grinding, uh, <laughs> grinding face making. Oh, I hate The Revenant. So for me, it's just like I I you know I love dramas. I love like stuff like that. Like uh, like I watch everything, mm-hmm. but it's like it's always. I mean, there's a few that work and it's fine. But generally speaking, it's like movies need a little bit of. Levity, because um, I think I think if you don't have comedy, people find a place to laugh uncomfortably. You know, they'll find a moment yeah, on their own. The release of tension. Yeah, I think you need it as a human being. Yeah. So, it, and 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 I think the, the, that being said, I'm sure there's you know I could find ten exceptions of movies that are just pure drama through and through, and they work. You know, but I think 
you, you know, generally speaking, you just need it. It's, yeah. uh, whether it's to help you connect with characters or or whatever it is, it's just, uh, I don't know. Yeah. And in the case of Annie Hall, you have a movie that is, in fact, funnier than the creators thought it would be because of that the, the coke scene. They had to build, they had to use the last, like, up until the last frame before someone calls cut of them just standing there as that coke smoke clears because the audience would laugh over the next minute yeah. of film. They need to do a re-edit where they extended yeah. the shot, yeah. Over and over and over again, they realized they just, like, whatever we shot is going in because people wouldn't stop laughing. Yeah. And it's not... Like, it is funny. And that in and of itself was an accident, too. Yeah. Right? The the cough or whatever. Yeah, the sneeze. Yeah, the tapioca powder that they were using or something. I think so or something. To. Yeah. It is just so... It's so amazing to see a movie like this exist where the filmmaker like really doesn't know what he's doing really <laughs> when they're making the movie like every accident folds in it's like um it's like jaws jaws is the example i use of the greatest cinematic mistakes becoming strengths oh like the, they, the, they build the, a shark it doesn't work doesn't work yeah so you have to puff up the character stuff and you have to have more sequences of suspense where you cannot you literally cannot show this thing that you were supposed to build your entire movie around so it becomes infinitely more terrifying because you can't see it, and it's terrifying just to see the waterline. But that's um, where you like. That's where the magic happens. Yeah. Right? And then with any hall, it's like, well, I thought I was making a three-hour movie about misery, and it's not that at all. No. And it's people love it and cherish it, and it's funny, and it keeps winning. Like it keeps winning prizes, and it won't stop, and it just becomes. It's on this lists. Thing. It's on every like AFI yeah. list for you know the genre. It's 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 inside of uh, La Di Da. I think is like number 55 for the most quotable lines of all yeah. time whereas I'm due back on planet earth now is still my favorite but nobody remembers that what's one. that from oh, it's the Christopher Walken scene oh right which yes. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. again is the the moment where you can watch Christopher Walken become a movie star he's so great uh, and this tiny incidental appearance I have uh, a... may I confess something to you <laughs> he's what's incredible crazy. and then that great cut to them driving and just yeah. like pan across his face I have a, an old girlfriend gave me a pillowcase that said, um, this is the most fun I've ever had without laughing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Written onto it. Uh, and I think it's things like this that further cloud the Woody Allen person versus Woody Allen filmmaker mm -hmm. discussion because I can't believe, I cannot reconcile the idea that someone is so aware of humanity and so compassionate towards his characters and empathetic in every way. I can't rec I can't reconcile that image with the act that he's accused of. With like it, with Polanski, it's easier. And you know what? I think that's a great argument because it's like because that's I think that's what messes me up because mm -hmm. it's like you want to believe it's not true because it's like but he he's aware of this. Yeah. Like he knows. Yeah, I think that's I I have never really thought of it in that quite specific yeah. term, but I think that's what what trips me up. And yeah, with Roman Polanski, you have. I mean, I've read his autobiography. I know his story. He just had an absolutely hideous childhood. He was survived the Holocaust. He went through all this. He lost Sharon Tate in the most horrifying mm -hmm. way possible. Like, every every stroke of this guy's life... None is, of it excuses it, but you no, get it. you understand how the brain could compartmentalize. Like, I get how... And then you see the films he makes with the dark... Like, Macbeth is this this horrifying work of violence of a man who's had his, his family ripped away from him, and then he's going for it and recreating it and then you can also on some level well it was california in the 70s a lot of people probably did this sort of thing he's the one who got caught like you can you find ways to rationalize it when it seems to line up mm -hmm. and i think it's easier um but then he runs away and you know that it's true there's so also it's like that. he's not hiding yeah. from it either whereas alan just lets where alan and, and Mia have it. sort of let their surrogates fight it out and never really confronted it mm -hmm. yeah it, like Certainly never in a court or anything like that. And, and and we were on the outside just trying to figure out what's happening. It's still, obviously, 20-odd years later, I'm still struggling with it. But it's, yeah, because it was in the 90s, because it was when... Um, it was when Husbands and Wives came out, right? And they were working on Bullets Over Broadway. Yeah. Because it was... It, is it Douglas McGrath was the co-writer on, on that? Bullets, yeah. I, think I remember reading an interview with him talking about Alan's ability to compartmentalize, too. And, like, they'd be working away on something, and then all of a sudden he'd get a phone call about from his lawyer or this or that about the case and he'd go over and spend half an hour with that and they'd be, it'd be not quite heated because I don't think Alan probably ever yells yeah. you know, as heated as he gets or intense as he gets and then he just he said he'd hang up the phone sigh and like back to our little comic bobble <laughs> Jesus and it's and but I, I can only imagine at that time is that he almost probably had to create something like Bulls Over Broadway which is you know 
pure comedy just to kind of like to have that escape yeah something to retreat to I could sort of see that too I mean just and then you get something like Deconstructing Harry where maybe his last truly like alive film in terms of ideas rather than dredging up old plots and and regurgitating them well Deconstructing Harry is is essentially Wild Strawberries right yeah and it feels as well like a piece of Annie Hall that got away like the the idea of the creator confronting his creations and things like that and you sort of feel that same energy Mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's his last truly alive work I think and ever since then he just settled he took the DreamWorks deal and started cranking or no well Sweet and Lowdown is pretty good too but after that and Sweet and Lowdown is also the one where that picks up the thread that's first dangled in Deconstructing Harry which is that an artist should be able to do whatever he wants regardless of its effect on human beings and the consequences on the world Mm -hmm. that's where it gets really thorny because that's that's clearly coming right out of his breakup in the court cases like there's no question in my mind that that's why he starts fixing on this is two movies in a row which are um, three if you include celebrity which are why won't people let me do what I want oh there's celebrity yeah we don't like to talk about celebrity <laughs> but but it's fascinating to see that become a constant in his work because it's happened a few more times too subsequently I want this why can't I just have it like that's what match point is all about yeah and the, the and this weird hollow mirrors way rational man is kind of like that too yeah it's something he's never really stopped like he started humping that to the detriment of his work and I don't think he knows he's doing it um, I mean even Midnight in Paris is really kind of about that just wanting to escape the responsibilities of the present by retreating into a world where everybody loves you mm-hmm. but that psychological connection is a lot easier for me to make I think yeah and, and that's about like the idea that you're never quite happy the grass is always greener yeah it's like everything before was always better and it's like and that's yeah. and, and the beautiful and you know the metaphor in that is beautiful especially when the is uh, what's her name? The um, French actress. Oh, um, Marion Cotillard. When she wants to live in the twenties, yeah. or not the twenties, the the eighteen nineties. Eighteen nineties. Right? Um, oh, the... one thing I meant to comment on back when you were talking just about like how like Woody, like Annie Hall is essentially created inside of, like you know this movie shouldn't work and how, the connections were able to be in the editing room. What and I think he still does it is like. He's famous for having two weeks of reshoots built into his production budget, okay. and he just does it. So um, he can find the movie. Well, he can fix it. He just know. He I think he just goes in knowing that he's going to need extra stuff. Because well, when you're pumping out a movie a year, you, yeah. you're not spending, you know, because you're still in post production and shooting. And so while he's you know editing one, he's writing another. Yeah. And so he's not ever spending that much time on the script. I can't imagine how one would function. Like, how do you? Because I know movie making is two years of your life into a single project, and the you would presumably need focus. <laughs> I can't conceive of writing something else while you're trying to tell this one story. Well, I think he can just compartmentalize. Yeah, I think he's able yeah. to do that, and, and, and in a way, I mean, that's some. I mean, I do that as well. Like I compartmentalize. Um, I don't think to my detriment yet. <laughs> so I mean, far, it, but do my, you like? Do you find yourself because because filmmaking is problem solving. Like on a, on a very basic scale, how do we shoot this? How do we do this? How do we make this funny? Yeah, but do you what, find yourself solving the other problems? Does it work unconsciously? It helps because you're able to step away. Okay, because you're able to. Because I think the problem is if you're just working. For me, anyway, I find that if if you're just working on one thing and that's all you're working on is that if you're having a problem with it, you don't really get away from it. You're still thinking about it. It's still bothering you. But if you're able to go, well, I have to think about this right now. And when you come back, you can almost have a fresh perspective much quicker. Mm. By because you had to focus on that, and I found for me it's like having kids has helped that a lot too. Okay, because it's just like they, you know, you need to feed them, you, right. need, you need to keep them alive. So it's like so you just have to put something down sometimes. Whereas you know, before when I was, you know, before I had kids or I was single, I'm like, well, I could just sit around and think about a scene all day and all night. Right. But now I can't. I have to literally turn my brain off, put it into something else, and then later on I go back that night and it's like, what was I worrying about? And I'm like, oh, that. Well, I can fix. Well, why was I doing that anyway? And I find it resets me better. And so having multiple, not multiple, like a couple of different things going on at once, I find that's for me is helpful. And so I understand how Woody Allen's about able to do that. I mean, they're not, all, you know, less and less it seems to be working for him as yeah. he gets older. But, um, but I think it's almost necessary too, just in our world, that it takes so long to get a project set up and out into the world. Sure. Yeah. That if you're not, or at some point overlapping, you know, you're going to be five years between movies or four years. And some people are that. And, and you know, in, in the U.S. system, that's sustainable because yeah. the, the money's there. Yeah, you're always in production. You're yeah. always doing something. 
or just you're being paid more or the, you know you're all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. right so it's like you're able to sustain that where development deals development deals mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff yeah you can get, you can get away with it but not all of us <laughs> not everyone can do that yeah. so sometimes it, so for him it's just, and I think I mean I'm, I, I'm sure he's you know he could retire have retired 20 years ago and never had to worry about money but I think he just treats it very much like a day job it's like I get up I you know I do this I think I know I'm sure you know too is like the stories that he you know he basically stops at five every day yeah and he doesn't have a long grueling shooting schedule yeah it's like he because well, he wants to get to the next game yeah he doesn't it, it's, or his it's, dinner reservations or he's playing at yeah he's Michael, playing he's flute at Michael cool. not, not flute he plays the uh, clarinet. clarinet at yeah. Michael's it's um it's weird I had this because you say that and and my first thought is Eastwood who you know like famously likes to be done by lunch if he can do it <laughs> and shoots rehearsals and doesn't communicate with it. like he just tells people I didn't know that about him does this little thing I actually met them both on the same day I had this weird tiny moment in New York in 2010 I was there for the hereafter junket uh, and I got to ask Eastwood a question and he tried to it was about aging and being relevant and how almost all of his movies are about that uh, since like the mid 80s hmm. they're about how he's getting or I'd like, say the early 90s they're about being older but still being committed and involved in the world and if you look at stuff like true crime and absolute power there's all this weirdness about how his character is so much older but he's not casting younger women he's finding ways not to interact with them mm. and then it gets silly and stuff like blood work and then he comes back again it's so the space would, cowboys are somewhere in there it's totally in there space cowboys is literally about <laughs> yeah <laughs> being old idea. and relevant so yeah. yeah and he tried to dodge it and laugh it off because hereafter is about death um, and you know Matt Damon who was also in this press conference just said no 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 hang on let's, uh, let's actually confront this and Matt Damon made Clint Eastwood answer a question and it was great because it was one of those moments where everyone in the room could sort of tell that he was trying to laugh it off and I was nervous because I'm talking to a legend you up, who yeah. I met like 10 seconds earlier and who is probably but now Matt, Matt Damon's got your back yeah so. yeah. oh Matt Damon whatever he does <laughs> he gets a fruit basket from me on that one um, but but after that I was only in New York for a day or for a night and a day and I went to uh, I went somewhere I was staying on the Upper East Side where the, the hotel was where they put us all up and it was during the New York Film Festival so we went to Lincoln Center for the press conference and happened there and then I'm walking back to the hotel and I'm I'm higher than I need to be so I'm walking south on Park Avenue and there's Woody fucking Allen Woody Allen and Sun Yi are walking on the same block as me they're coming right at me and for a second it's just like that can't possibly be right this is not happening. I cannot, like, two American yeah. film icons in the same yeah. two hours window. And it's like, nope, that's him. And what do you do? Like, you don't do anything. You just sort of nod and don't want to bother him because that's the whole legend of it. So I, even now, I don't know what I would say to him if I met him. Like, I don't do think I start? would. I'm not, I, I, I don't. He looked like a wax version of himself. Like, it was, it sure. was an unforgiving fall sunlight day. Yeah. Was, he looked very pasty. I even have a hard time going up to people, um, even in like the Toronto film community, mm-hmm. unless I have something to say. Because I don't ever want to be the person that just like gushes over something, because nobody ever wants to hear that. Yeah. You know? Um, I've sort of developed an armor to that sort of thing, too. Like, you just want to... You just... Like, I've, I walk past so many people in the halls at TIFF that I've just admired for decades. And, you know, it's... And then sometimes, like Jim Broadbent, I bumped into in a hallway once and I just said, oh, hey, how are you? I, mm-hmm. Nice to see you. And, and I have nothing else because I'm just going to go on for That's good 10 hours about everything I've loved. Yeah. My end is I usually go like, we know the same other person, which just right. says, lets you know I'm not crazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that I'm giving myself a stamp of approval. Yeah. <laughs> Since starting the podcast, I've been doing that a lot. Yeah. It's like, hey, he mentioned you on the show. That kind of thing. Makes nice. it easier. And also, yes, I'm because I'm repeatedly asking people to come into my basement where I might kill them. But it's like the most amazing basement. Once, you guys can't see this. But oh, once everybody gets down here, they love it. Norma literally has... Pretty much like ninety seven percent of the Criterion Collection. Uh, yeah, on the wall. at this like, point, I mean, really close. A lot of it. And a giant Futurama head. A lot of it was free when it's when I started, but I pretty much buy three fifths of well, everything you, I released. You got to keep it up. You can't. Yeah, I can't. And yarn. Down. You got yarn. Well, that's Kate's thing. Well, we'll see. We'll but again, disagree. I'm not going to tie anybody up. Please, please come down and join us in the basement. Uh, but it is this weird pitch where you have to put someone at ease before they ever, you know before they ever start talking about their own lives and opening up in, in an interview situation. But it makes it easier. Like, this I actually... Yeah, it's like, right before, right when you launched this, I was actually playing with the idea of a new podcast. Oh, yeah. And then you did this, and I'm like, I can't do it, Norm, just my idea. Well, you didn't steal my idea. Would it something had. similar? It was... The, the difference was, it was going to be um, me sitting down with people and watching movies and doing a commentary track. 
okay. on a movie for a movie that wasn't yours. But then I'm like, so everyone's going to be two hours long? It's like, that's a long time to ask people to commit. So that was the biggest stumbling block I couldn't get over. It's pretty intimidating. Yeah. And then literally this popped up. I was like, nope, that's, no one did it the right way. And, <laughs> and I was amazed that nobody was doing it. I was really so surprised when this, you know, you just, people are more themselves when they're talking about something they really love. Yeah. But there's also this wave, and it, it was it's still going now, there's, there was this wave of podcasts about bad movies. You know, we hate movies, and how did this get made, and, and um, the flop house, and they're they're yeah. not bad. They're, there's a place for those, definitely, for the for the sort of evisceration of bad art, but they're all so negative. And like, there's something positive in the world. Yeah, I just, oh, I yeah. really like talking about things that are good. I mean, I'm a film critic, I can talk about things that are bad, and I can do that for a while, but it doesn't help the world. No, but that's not, but, but, but by proxy of it, you end up, like, touching on the bad stuff. Like, we've talked about, you know, that would not everything in Woody Allen's filmography is untouchable and pure and perfect. Right, yeah. So that comes out of it anyway, but I think there is something really honorable about, like, wanting to, like, get the best out of people through something that they love and they yeah. care about, right? And I think there's just a joy that comes from that. There is so much negative stuff, especially online. It's like, it's it's so easy to write, like... And there's the great line in Ratatouille about, like, the critics talk about how it's, like, it's really, you know, it's fun and easy to write negative, nasty things, and it's mm-hmm. fun to read. But it's, like, you're not helping, and it's not... And, and Kevin Smith has that great line about how you you gain everything by encouraging other people... And another artist, or something like that, and you gain nothing by knocking them down. Yeah, I know? mean, you can warn people away. My my purpose as a critic, I think, on some level, is to be a bulletproof vest for your thirteen dollars. <laughs> just yeah, like, I took this hit. You don't have to. Don't bother with this thing that is bad. But if I have the opportunity to do whatever I want, I'm going to send people the good stuff. I, I just wrote six hundred words about Kirstami this week, and it was exhilarating. Mm-hmm. And now, like, there's podcasts, and you can delve into them, and you can That's spend amazing. years covering one thing. And then there's somewhere else in the world there are these guys who are watching um, Grown Ups 2 every week and making a podcast about that. And that just seems like torture. And it's like, there's got to be something better to do with your time. Now, what I was going to say is, like, I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer that there's, like, there's two different kinds of, you know, critics, right? There's the kind of people that are, like, people like yourself. That you, you, you take one look around your place, and it's like, you love movies. Like, you look at your... No, but it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like you, you look at your books, and it's like... So there's people that like like yourself and like Roger Ebert and, and people that just they they go into everything wanting to love it. Yeah, exactly. I, and then the people that go into everything wanting already having something made up in their mind or just they're failed filmmakers themselves or something and they just wanted you know an excuse to not to yeah. shit on something, right? Yeah, and it is. It's absolutely easier to be negative um, on the way in, like to go into a theater. God knows I've done it. I mean, I've seen all four Transformers movies in theaters. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're, you taking your lumps? Yeah, and that's ten hours of my life. Uh, but the, the <laughs> don't think about that. Don't no. start, don't add it up. But you like, you go in thinking every time. I'm I manage to go in thinking that well, Michael Bay is a technically amazing filmmaker. Why maybe once he'll get a script that's good and the odds are in his favor that yeah, at one time yeah. it's gonna be five. There <laughs> there's gonna be another one. We might as well enjoy it. And no one and no one sets out to make a bad movie. Like no yeah. one goes, hey, this script's mediocre. We should put this in development right away or into production it's like you know everyone's trying yeah i mean there are situations where stuff starts without a script and you hear about these amazing stories of finding it in the editing room and, and like even Annie Hall, which great, had yeah. a script and, and too much of one maybe but was something that no one expected to be what it is mm-hmm. and it is beautiful and wonderful and perfect and and i'm so glad we have it but more often than not yeah people want to make they have a story to tell. They want to do something. And yes, there's the, you know, let's make a movie where let's let's adapt the next young adult property and not spend too much time on the script because then the kids will come see anything. You can, you know, like mediocrity happens all the time. Sure. But truly, yeah, nobody wants to hurt. Like with the exception of Michael Haneke, nobody makes a movie that the audience is going to loathe oh. intentionally. Um, but but this, uh, yeah, to, to get back to the idea of, of yeah. celebrating a love of film, um, we get the final question, which is the... Mm. The, the question of inspiration. Is there anything from Annie Hall specifically or Woody Allen's uh, filmography largely that you've sort of cannibalized or appropriated in your own work? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we kind of touched on earlier with, with Diane Keaton and the idea of her being herself, I mean, that's the one thing I, I really try to get out of actors is is seeing, you know, a nugget of them that you normally don't see. Okay. Uh, or bringing some of their personality or humanity to the part. Um that, that that that's just not as common. I think it's like uh, it's funny. Someone, 
I'm trying to think of an example. A recent I, in in How to Plan an Orgy, I think a lot of people have come out going really being surprised by Catherine Isabel in that movie. I I honestly had never seen her be that funny before, and she was great. Like, and that's she's ha- and that's who she is in real life. Yeah, like that's as close to I've ever seen her in that movie, and that's something that I'm really proud of. That's great of, of getting that out of her and being able to to capture that on on in a movie. Um, and I think that she really enjoyed that too. And that came out of just meeting her and going and you know and, and kind of tweaking the character a little bit after I met her and going mm-hmm. okay well we can go in this direction and play with it. So I'm glad that you had that reaction yeah. too. No, she, um, I, she, her timing even the first couple of scenes is just so unlike anything I've seen her do before. And I guess it's because she started in Ginger Snaps and instantly everyone sees her as horror girl. Yeah. Like, be, and she's got a face that lends itself to intensity, but that intensity coming out as comedy is really good like it's yeah, a great fun. strength of hers that I, I mean you know being human I don't think she has she has a lot of ironic dialogue in that arc she had mm-hmm. uh, but she's not funny yeah. in a show that had room for it and then you see and I, I saw her in, in Orgy and it's like I want her to do this all the time like, right I want more oh good yay then I've yeah. succeeded that's and that's why I think that's one thing where the option of uh, uh, the opposite of, of Alan where I really love actors and I like working with them uh, and I, but I do try to stay out of their way too like I, try, I give them enough shape and we have a lot of conversations but I like to let them just kind of discover things and have fun but I'm there like I don't ignore them the way right. I think you know from what I've heard that he does uh, I think, but I think it's that I think it's also just trying to find comedy in mundane situations and in, and in the regular um, and taking things that are a bit more absurd and just finding a way to try to ground them Okay, is kind of what I've taken from my my love affair of Woody Allen. So, are you still going to his movies every time? Are you are you lining up and, and not as keeping hope alive? I think I saw a Rational Man in the theater, but I missed the Moonlight one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like it's not as like the year was that time, and I'm like, got to be there opening night, got to be there opening night. Yeah. And now it's kind of oh, it came out last week. Like I I, I don't. I've missed them more than I've I've caught them. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh no, I totally I feel you. I'm like I'm not even. There are press screenings I don't go to at this point, and it's just this weird exhaustion. I think the last one of his I saw in a theater was probably. Uh, I stopped reviewing them after whatever works because I felt I had nothing left to say. Yeah. Um, I think I saw You Will Meet a Tall Dark Stranger, theatrically. I saw that at TIFF. Midnight in Paris. Whichever of those was last. Yeah. It's the last one I saw theatrically. And then the Amazon series is yeah. dropping at some point. I, which, sometime this fall, I Which think? he regretted the moment he signed on to it, which which is typical Alan fashion. Yeah. I just love the idea of Woody Allen saying, I'll make a show for this thing that I don't use or watch or fully understand. And who knows what it's going to be like. Maybe it'll be the best thing he's ever done because you have no idea what format to play into and he'll do something novel, but... I, I think it's going to be one or the other. It's going to be amazing or it's going to be terrible. I would think a television series... Would you want a new Woody Allen movie every week? Like, because as opposed to the movies where, if he's releasing one a year and they're not that great and they're starting to cannibalize himself, at least we have eleven months to <laughs> break to sort of get. I'm just them. wondering how they'll work structurally. I'm just curious yeah, to yeah. like, what is it? The presentation of the are they going to are going to be like a, a format to each episode, or is it just going to be like are there even going to be like a beginning, middle, and end? Yeah. Like how it could. I'm excited for the possibility. Sure, because um, he could literally deliver anything. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like there was a really interesting comment about when the when the Force Awakens Star Wars trailer came out that they're like the reason why everyone has this level of excitement is because the last time it's probably the last time we'll be surprised by Star Wars again mm. because we don't know who the new characters are, what the new story is. Where you know with the prequels we had a sense yep, yep. of what came before, but it's like there's just this idea of like unlimited possibilities. And so, in a weird, so to bring it full circle back to Woody Allen and Star Wars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like nineteen seventy-seven, um, there, it's an interesting idea that it's like it's a new medium for him, and it's the first time he's done something in a different medium in ever in a long yeah. time in decades in his career. Yeah, his his television adaptations occasionally were you know like he did there was he there's a production of Don't Drink the Water from like yeah. fifteen years ago. He does a TV movie. He didn't direct it, I don't think, and it was produced. He did his own version. He did his own TV movie version that had Michael J. Fox in it. Right. Did he direct um, that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's the last thing he's done outside of cinema. Yeah. So for me, I'll be there to watch whatever his show is on day one because I'm just so curious. <laughs> but I, so I'm more curious about that than what his next movie is. 
I can see that. And for yourself, you you just launched an Indiegogo project for a feature film? A feature film that uh, was written by Aaron Abrams and Brendan Gall. Friend of the um, show. Friends of the show, yeah. So uh, Aaron also wrote uh, Young People Fucking, mm-hmm. and Brandon is a writer on Blindspot, on NBC's Blindspot. And so it's a script they wrote that's hilarious that uh, got sent to me. And uh, and we, we kind of went through the traditional roots to try to get some funding. And it's, it's a very dark, gritty comedy, but with a lot of heart. And so... As opposed to cannibalizing it and trying to like tone it down to be something it's not, we decided let's just make it ourselves, and and so that's what we're doing. So they're involved. Uh, Megan Park is is in it. it Will be in it. Then Christian Bruin is on as well, and we're, we're still working on attaching some some cast. But it's going to be a lot of fun. That's great. And so that is in Indiegogo now. Yeah. So you can just go on Indiegogo and search the Go Getters, and it'll come up. Great. And what's the window for that? Uh, we'll be going, I think our campaign will go on until the beginning of April. Right. So like the first weekend of April will be, uh, and we'll also be the opening night film for the Canadian Film Fest at the end of March. That's in Toronto? At it's in Toronto, Royal, it's at the right? Royal, yeah. yeah. Oh, great. I, um... So come by and yeah. the cast will be, some, we'll, be we'll have a fun Q&A. And it's, 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 that's just a fun festival. And yeah. a great theater, my favorite theater in the city. Oh, that's nice. And the, uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you do go down, uh, I think you'll be in a room, listener, with the largest number of guests for this show ever. Because How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town stars Ennis Esmer, Christian Brun, Tommy Amber Peary, and Christine Horn, all of whom have done episodes on the show, and now you are here. So that's, that's true. five. And we'll get more. We'll get, we're going to get the whole cast on here. Yeah, let's just start a line. Yeah. Bring them in. Fun. My thanks to Jeremy Lalonde, who'll be bringing How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town to the Canadian Film Festival in Toronto on March 30th, and then spreading it like an STD all over North America later this year. And be sure to search for The Go-Getters on Indiegogo.com to see what he's up to next. The campaign closes April 1st. You can find Jeremy on Twitter at Lalonde Jeremy, L-A-L-O-N-D-E Jeremy, all one word. And you can find Annie Hall on Blu-ray and DVD from MGM Home Entertainment in a very basic edition because Woody Allen doesn't believe in special features. It's also for sale or rental on iTunes and Google Play, and it looks pretty good in HD. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at nowtoronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, or on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. If you want to leave a review on iTunes, well, that would make a really nice anniversary present. Seriously, it's been a blast doing the show, and I look forward to... Many, many, many more episodes. Thanks for listening. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud.